Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, we'll get started here shortly. We'll get the room about a minute to get uh, filled up and then we'll get started. All right, thanks again for joining us. Looks like we have about critical mass here. So we'll go ahead and try to get started uh, real fast. I pardon, I apologize for my voice. It's, it's going in and out today. So welcome to today's webinar. It's uh, what's hot in heat pumps. So today we've got joining us uh, Garrett Smith. He's Mitsubishi's area sales manager for the Austin and Central Texas region. Uh, but first, as always, before I let him introduce himself, we've got a couple of things of housekeeping to go through. So those, any of those on here that are new for SPEAR, um, what SPEAR is and what we do is we're a nonprofit. We're considered one of six RIOs, which is Regional Energy Efficiency Organization. We are a member-based nonprofit organization with uh, over 50 members ranging from uh, manufacturers to third parties to other stakeholders that are involved in learning energy code and uh, adoption and acceleration of the energy code throughout Texas and Oklahoma. So Garrett, are you on? I'm here. All right, just real quick, I wanna speak to just those that are looking for some uh, CEUs and how this works is um, within about 72 hours after this webinar, you'll receive a course completion survey from Kathy Lawrence. Please complete that, fill it out, send it back. Once she receives the survey, she will send you your course completion certificate, which includes the title of this webinar and the um, course ID to turn in for your, when you're actually doing your CEUs for ICC. Also, as always, I will be monitoring the Q&A session and the chat feature is open as well. Uh, Garrett, I'm not sure if you want us to have questions as we go through or wait till the end. Uh, probably best to wait to the end, um, okay. but uh, if there's something that seems pressing, I'll, I'll let you speak up about it. All right. I will monitor that. And if something comes up, I'll find a break to, uh, to jump in. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen if you want to share your screen. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to present for us, Garrett. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Well, then we'll uh, we'll jump into it if everyone's ready. I think we're good. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, like Randy was saying, my name is Garrett Smith. I'm the area manager for uh, for Mitsubishi Electric uh, Train US, based here in the Austin, Texas area. I just wanted to give a little background about myself. Um, I promise I won't make you look at this picture the whole time, but um, I've, I've kind of stepped through a lot of different parts of the industry, uh, first starting in a, a, as a residential contractor for HVAC uh, based in the San Antonio area. I moved over to distribution where I had a, a couple of different roles there. Um, and I've been with Mitsubishi since uh, about halfway through 2022. So the industry is definitely something I've been in for a good amount of time um, and uh, certainly kind of have a passion for for what the industry has been, where it's where it's going um, and, uh, and even where it is today when it comes to to heat pumps and how it plays into it really works kind of across the entire state of Texas uh, and uh, and seeing adoption in heat pumps from every home gets one um, to they're not stocked in a hundred mile radius because uh, that's just not not the premise of that market. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be working here and excited to be with you all this morning. Uh, so looking forward to jumping into it. I know there's a probably a mixed bag of, of people who are on this call. So I do want to kind of do a, a high level overview of, of heat pump basics. Now, um, this is not by any stretch going to be a super technical class or, or time. So uh, don't feel like there's going to be a, um, a quiz or that you need to fully understand this. But really, the, the, the big takeaway from, from this graph here is that um, the heat pumps are, are simply just a heat transfer device. We're, we're moving heat from one place to another and we're, we're using a little bit of electricity to, to do that. Um, and so we can see there on, on the left, um, we're, uh, we're moving hot air or, or heat outside and we're, we're uh, transferring that, uh, that cooling effect to the inside. And then in, in reverse, right? When, it, when we're trying to heat our homes, uh, we, we simply just re reverse the actions and now we're, uh, we're able to pull heat from outside and bring it inside. 
So it is a, on a high level, that's what a heat pump is. And that's, um, that's been that case for, for a very long time. However, not all heat pumps are equal. Uh, on the left, we have more of a conventional setting with that, uh, that black line at 72 degrees being your constant. Um, and then we see that, uh, that the compressor on a traditional or conventional system comes on and uh, keeps that temperature kind of where it's at. But we, we see that the, the temperature in the room is going slightly below and slightly above that, um, that set point, that it's not, it's not being able to, to ride that wave, if you will. And so the comfort in the home, you're always going to feel a little bit warm before it comes on, a little bit cold after it has, uh, is finished or, or reversed, right? Or you might be a little bit uh, cold and then warm or however that might be. We, we look at the right um, and, you know, while, yes, we're going to, I'm going to reference a lot of Mitsubishi products here. This is, this is the case for any variable speed system um, that the, uh, the inverter and, and the compressor and all the components are able to work together to ramp that system down. And so we see that our compressor power is actually quite a bit lower uh, than just a hundred percent or nothing, but our temperature in the room is riding set point very, very closely. And that really is where the differences, the differences lie with variable speed systems um, versus, versus conventional. And so the comfort in the space is, is normally significantly higher, albeit a little bit different than what people are used to. Uh, but your energy savings are going to be astronomically different. So wanting to talk quickly about the, the comfort piece of it, if we think about uh, traditional systems, whether that be a gas-fired furnace um, or just a conventional AC system or even a, a regular heat pump, uh, what we see is these spikes in, in temperature, whether that be uh, cooling, where you have a lot of cold air coming out of the, the vents for a long period of time, uh, or even a short period of time. Same thing with the, with the heating piece, where you get these blasts of warm air, or a variable system isn't going to have that blast of, of hot or cold air. Really, it's just designed to be putting out what it needs to in the space uh, and keeping that space comfortable. So it's important to know that that how the system heats and cools is going to be different. It's not just all on or all off. Uh, so there is some, some tempering or again, some variability to it. It's also worth noting that variable speed systems and are typically run by inverters, but inverter does not make a variable system. Uh, there are inverters that are staged pieces of equipment and that um, while it's better than a conventional on off, uh, is only marginally so. Uh, so really the, the word we want to look for uh, is variable speed, not just inverter. Inverters have been around for a very long time. They're used in a lot of different industries and a lot of different ways uh, simply to just invert the power. But that again, does not make it a, a variable speed system on its own. Further talking about the, uh, the comfort side of things, it's important to know with heat pumps, one of the reasons why um, why the, the comfort concern comes up as far as heat pumps being able to, to keep up or to, to give enough heat when it comes to these colder temperatures all has to do with a term con called balance points. And it's our capacitive balance point. Uh, so our friends over at Energy Vanguard put this graph out. This is showing an 18,000 BTU heat pump with a 15,000 BTU load. Now the load is going to be what the house needs at a given temperature. And typically this is going to be one or 2% of, uh, of design conditions for the year. Um, and so in this case, what we're seeing, uh, the graph is actually going to read from right to left, or, or at least that's how I'm going to, to review it today. So we see that orange line starting over at 65 on the right, that's our outdoor temperature, and going over to the A bullet point um, there on the left. And then we have our capacity being, again, the, the blue line going, in this case, from, uh, from C to B as our temperature goes down. So referencing the load, as we see that line go from 65 to A, we, we see it climbing as we as we decrease in temperature. So what it's telling us is that my heating load for the home is increasing as the outdoor temperature is decreasing. Simply put, we need more heating capacity to maintain 
our temperature, our set temperature inside of the space, the colder it gets. We need to have more insulation or just more heat in general. At the same time, the heat pump, because all we are doing is moving heat from outside to inside, as there is less heat available as that temperature decreases, we're seeing that our capacity over at C, which is at 47 degree outdoor temperature, um, is decreasing as we slide over to B, which is going to be at 17 degrees. And where those two inter intersect, that D point there, is what's referred to as our balance point. And that balance point fluctuates depending on the type of equipment, depending on the load of the home. Um, but what it's saying is that that point and below outdoor temperature, that heat pump no longer has the ability to match the load of the house to maintain temperature. And so this is where you start to see a discrepancy uh, in, the, uh, in the heating capacity for heat pumps and where you may have a home or a system that struggles to maintain temperature. Now here in Texas, are we, are we getting below these temperatures that uh, we're using this as an example where D is at? Uh, you know, for most of the year, no, but we do have these, these more extremes that we've been seeing to become more common. Um, and it's important to know this, that when we're designing a heat pump system, we, we can't just look at the cooling side that we've been used to seeing uh, are used to designing, but we also have to pay attention to the heating side. This again, isn't necessarily a, a downfall of heat pumps, but it's something else to, to consider as we look through it. And when we look at, uh, at variable speed heat pumps, the, the term cold climate heat pump has been tossed around for a good amount of time. Um, and we're really trying to uh, maybe change that or get, at least get people to look at, at cold climate and, and maybe a better word is, is an all climate heat pump. Um, and mainly for, for the reason that uh, heat pumps work even when it's not cold outside, right? But even when it is, we have these, uh, these cold climate systems that, uh, that are able to produce 100% of rated capacity. So going back to that graph in the previous slide, down to five, negative five, or negative 10. And we see that the, the H2I SUMO, which is one of our, uh, one of our newer products, is gonna be our highest heating capable system, uh, is able to not only give you 100% at negative 10, but it's actually able to function all the way down to negative 34. And this is while also providing up to a 34.5 SEER2 rating. So we're very efficient, even as we get very cold outside and then as far as the rest of the lineup goes, we still have our other 100% at five and negative five that we've seen great success with and, and a lot of adoption, even in your more Southern markets where people wanna have a little bit more peace of mind uh, for these temperatures, especially when we see that, uh, that balance point. And again, it's that one or 2% of the year that, uh, that's always going to be, um, that's always gonna be a little bit more uh, needed, right? And I think it's worth noting that these systems here, we're talking about strictly heat pump technology. There's no resistance heat. There's no backup systems. This is, this is just that heat pump transferring heat from outside, even at negative 34, where there's very little left um, over into the side of the home and still being able to provide some level of heating uh, in, inside of that space. So it's really advanced technology. And we're seeing this, this all climate uh, type systems to really come out more and more in the market uh, like we haven't in the past. So that, that fear of getting away from gas or, or even just converting to, a, uh, to an all electric system using the heat pump function, um, that uh, with these systems here, it really gets rid of a lot of the fear that people have by, by simply able to show the performance of that piece of equipment. When we look at, um, at winter heating here in Texas, it's interesting to see that 61% of homes are heated or their primary heat source is, is by electric heat. And, and a large majority of, of that is resistance heat. And when we go to resistance heat, we're, we're losing the benefits of our heat pump. And, and typically we're seeing that on older systems that it's anywhere between 32 and 45 degrees. And so we see this um, uh, these heat pumps that it's great that you have a heat pump, but realistically, when we start getting these cold snaps, they become just resistance heaters at that point. And they're, they're functionally no different if it had the heat pump or not, once it gets below that, that balance point. 
So having a, a more powerful or more all climate system really gives that benefit to, uh, to stretch the strength and the energy savings that we see out of, out of heat pumps versus just going to resistance heat. Now talking about that, um, that efficiency or that economic balance point. So again, this, this graph here on the right or this image on the right is showing um, a little bit maybe simplified way of how a heat pump functions. Um, so what we're seeing here is that we're able to, uh, to move heat, we're able to grab heat from our outdoor unit, we're able to put it through, um, through our compressor, add a little bit of power to it, and then we're able to, to discharge that, uh, that into the indoor. So we're, we're able to, to move heat, again, from outside to inside by only adding just a little bit of power um, to that system. And that's referenced over on the left. Uh, so this is taken out of one of our books, but these numbers are are universal when it comes to the, the definitions. So we, we're pretty familiar with SEER, most people are. EER and HSPF as well are, are more commonplace, but what gets overlooked a lot, and it, and it really shouldn't be, is the COP or the coefficient of performance. And so what we can see here is at 47, this system is giving us a 4.68, which if you're not familiar with that, it means for every kilowatt of power that you're, or heat that you're buying, you're getting 4.68 back. And we see that, um, again, represented in that graph there on the right of, of how that actually functions. 468% more efficient um, than just a resistance heater. As we slide down in temperature, that efficiency does go down. We have less heat to work with outside, so we've got to implement more, and the system has to work harder to, to get that heat from outside to in. Uh, but we see even at negative 13, the same system is just shy of a COP of two, so 1.93. Again, so 193% one, more efficient uh, than resistance heat, and that's again, even all the way down at negative 13. So we see a lot of efficiency gains, even deep into those temperatures, uh, those cold temperatures outside, um, that even, uh, even we get well below freezing and even well below zero, we are, uh, we're at least two, times more efficient or thereabouts than resistance heat or, um, or gas furnaces. And so it's really interesting to see this, that when you have these high efficient, high performing units that we can be deep in those temperature drops and still be as efficient as we wanna be. When we look at why that matters, uh, we, we just have to simply look back um, into, uh, into some previous years. Um, and so what we see here is that um, that ear caught in the 2011 versus 21 event comparisons, we have this maximum load shed requested of, of about 20,000 megawatts. If we uh, if we take that out and we put that into uh, into Texas translation or into a, a kind of a more broader scale, we see that 11.2 million housing units or homes um, are translated down to 6.8 million of those are all electric. And if we're able to add all climate heat pumps into those homes, we would be saving around 26,000 megawatts. And that's continuous. That's not just during these peaks. That's, that's all the time. But during these peaks, when this load shed was requested, if we had simply removed our resistance heat requirements, we would have been more than capable of, of weathering that storm with even some to spare. Um, and so that's really, again, showing the, the difference here um, or the, the efficiency gains out of variable speed systems versus traditional systems that would revert back uh, to, uh, to resistance heat. And we see this, that, uh, that air source heat pumps versus electric resistance there on the left, that in a, in a traditional winter day, that we're seeing those temperatures um, as they decrease, our energy use is increasing, right? So it's uh, directly inverse of each other. Um, and so having these, these heating capacity units really again does show during these high peak environments and not just uh, not just when the weather's a little bit more fair as we're more used to seeing with, uh, with traditional heat pumps. It's important to, to talk about, I think that, it's, um, that electrification is taking a lot of different forms here recently. Uh, we see that in, in water heaters, in electric vehicles, obviously in our HVAC equipment, and everything else from stovetops to any other appliance in the home is looking to be a little bit more efficient or become all electric, whether it be, again, through dryers and, and anything else. Um, 
However, electrification can't just be for the sake of electrification. We have to be a little bit more smart with, with what we're doing. And I'm going to talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, but we also see here represented in this graph that, that there's weatherization options. That's through uh, simply with attic insulation or, or upgraded windows or doors or other, uh, other weatherization tactics. Uh, but if that's all what we're leaning on is to make the home a little bit better at, at weatherization, but still having inefficient electrical components, whether again, that be through the water heater, the HVAC or whatever that might be, we're, we're really handcuffing ourselves to what we can have um, and, the, and the true benefits there. We can't, uh, we can't weatherize our way out of inefficient equipment. And so we just need to have a more holistic approach um, that we need to be working in conjunction with weatherization and high efficiency electrical devices. I mentioned that uh, we're not electrifying just for the sake of electrification. We need to be a little bit more strategic with it. Um, and so when we look at the strategic uh, benefits to, to electrification, we, we just kind of can look through some of these. Um, and so when we're, when we're defining it, we need to have at least one of these following conditions. Um, and so as we're, as we're looking through these saving consumers money over time, we benefit the environment, we're improving our product quality, consumer quality of life, um, but then we're also fostering more robust and resilient grid. Again, if we are just simply removing uh, or transitioning products, whether that be a heat pump, uh, from a older heat pump, and we're simply changing it out for uh, more like for like, there's going to be marginal increases in that performance. We really have to take a look at what we're putting into these homes, not just to make them electric, but to be high efficient or to be all climate rated or cold climate rated. So we can be smart with the power that we're using and not just using power for the sake of using power. Um, we, we see that we had a, um, uh, a, con a builder out in the Houston area, and I've got a video to show, so I'm hoping that's going to play well through, uh, through this presentation here, but just giving a little bit of a, of a backstory on this. Uh, this home was, uh, was built in Houston with uh, Giga Construction, and they, they set out to build a house or a home uh, there in Houston that was energy efficient enough to rely solely on its solar and battery systems year round. Um, and, and this wouldn't have been possible if they were using uh, antiquated technology or, or high load systems, whether that be through HVAC or anything else. Um, and so again, I've got a, just a quick excerpt from this video uh, or this bigger showcase that I'd like to show here. So hopefully this works for everybody. Mitsubishi pairs very well with a home that is going to be run fully off of a solar panel grid. You know, in standard homes, one of the biggest pullers of electricity is your HVAC system. And with Mitsubishi, you take that down to next to nothing. With this home specifically, the HVAC system was extremely important because it was running off of solar panels. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is with a Mitsubishi system. With your standard unitary system, you're going to get a very hard start and it's going to pull too much electricity. If you're wanting to do a solar panel roof and have your AC run solely on that, then it's the only route to go. There's so many options with Mitsubishi that the possibilities are endless. There's a stigma about solar that, yes, it will let me down at certain times. It won't produce as efficiently at certain times, no doubt, when it's cloudy. But if you pair solar with battery backup, your home will remain off the grid. It's all about marrying smart solutions together and being seamless with the design. And it's really not that difficult to do, quite frankly. When you have solutions like Mitsubishi Electric System that are already low drawers of power, it's actually pretty simple to pair that system up with a solar array that's average size. Okay, so as we saw there, again, they, they really set out to build this home and, and they were successful in, in doing what, uh, what they set out to. Um, and, and it really is a, an interesting testament to 
to not only you know the the variable system that we're talking about now, but you know how they work in conjunction with everything else. So if uh, if you want to watch the rest of it, that is on our our YouTube channel, um, and I'd encourage you to. It's a it's a good little um, insight into uh, into building technology, and and again they built the home to sell, so they're basing it on their clientele and uh, give some really good insight in what they were able to accomplish. We look at um, kind of taking that and, and extrapolating it out into uh, into a larger scale. Uh, we see that um, that national and regional studies over the past decade or so have consistently shown that home buyers are interested in energy efficiency, renewables, and all together playing into features that make the home that they're purchasing or that they're living in more comfortable, more healthy, and safer for everyone that's there. And when we see the uh, the energy saving features as as windows and appliances these whole home certifications, they're ranked as among the top 10 must-haves that buyers are looking at. Um, and that says a study as of 2019. And I'd venture to say that that's, that's only increasing as time goes on. And so as we're, we're looking at that, we see that buyers are wanting clean indoor air. They're wanting comfort, this energy efficiency that, that hasn't really been seen in the past or hasn't been prioritized in the past is, is now being there. And they're willing to pay a, a heat pump premium or a premium for high efficiency features inside of the home. And we see that through, uh, through zone control, through less temperature swings, the renewables. Yes, there is going to be cost to having different or higher efficiency products inside of the homes. Um, but with that all being said, they can see it as a return. They can have more, they can be more comfortable in the homes. Um, I've even heard from, from some builders here recently that they've started getting calls and follow-up from, from clients after they've built or sold the home to them, thanking them for the air conditioning systems or for the high efficiency systems in their homes. And they said that, that previously all they talk about was the countertops and, and cabinets, the things they could see. But now they're starting to talk about the things that they can feel or, or what's affecting their, their efficiency and their cost when it comes to their utility rates. Um, so again, we're, we're seeing this transition, this, this green premium being a higher uh, focus uh, where we're, we may have this 3 to 14% total increase in sales price. Uh, but, but again, homeowners are, are wanting to pay this to get the benefits out of it. And again, it's not just to be more energy efficient. They also want to be more comfortable inside of their home, which again, is uh, we've, we've all kind of been accustomed to how AC units of yesterday work. Uh, but there's this new wave of, of options and, and people are wanting to take advantage of it. We see, uh, we see electrification making headlines and this has been going on for some time. Uh, but when we, when we look at all the different places that we're seeing uh, these terms being brought up in, in the mainstream medias, we're, we're starting to see this, this again, this trend change. Um, and, and these organizations wouldn't be reporting on this transition if it wasn't truly impacting or being interested, uh, interesting to, to their consumers, to their readers. Um, and so we're, we're seeing these large increases in, uh, in searches up 40% from years prior where they're looking for equipment, they're looking for variable speed, they're looking for heat pumps um, in, in all, all areas from deep in the south to, to far in the north um, and everywhere in between. Last year, we, uh, we commissioned a study uh, called the Heat Pumps and Homeowners Index. And this is a third party uh, study that was done. But what we did was reach out to uh, homeowners, prospective homeowners, and try to get a feel for where, uh, where air conditioning fit into the homeowner's idea of what they were most excited about. Um, and something that was really interesting that popped out here and among others was that uh, was the HVAC system was the number one or the highest rated upgrade that homeowners were excited about. And we see that with all homeowners and millennials as well, that it edged out solar, electric vehicles, all the same. Um, and while I can understand solar, it's, it is quite interesting to see that electric vehicles was not something that homeowners were excited about nearly as much as their air conditioning system. Now, the the other part of this story that it tells is one of education that needs to happen around heat pumps. 
because while we do see that 57% of all homeowners are interested or excited, most excited about upgrading their HVAC system, only 38% are interested in heat pumps. And now this could be for a number of reasons, but there is that delta that we need to work against. And, and again, to show that, that heat pumps can be very capable in all conditions and they're applicable for every homeowner, not just for, for a select few in certain markets. So again, this is exciting to see, but it also shows us that we have some work ahead of us uh, to educate U.S. homeowners on the, the efficiencies and the better benefits of heat pumps over just traditional HVAC systems. Now, some good news in the HVAC side or the heat pump side is we see that, um, that in 22, heat pump sales did surge past furnaces for the first time. And then we see in 23, so last year, that uh, the increase was up to 21% or more uh, from 12% back in 2022. So we're seeing this transition where more heat pumps are being sold than gas furnaces. Um, and this isn't necessarily encouraging fuel switching, uh, but what we're seeing is that this, uh, this heat pump technology is starting to take hold in ways that it may not have in the past. This is done in a number of ways, but one of them uh, that can't be under, undersold is dual fuel systems. And so this is an example of one of our products, uh, but there's others out there that are similar to it, where it, it matches to our variable speed, all climate outdoor systems or heat pumps, uh, but it retrofits onto an existing gas furnace. And what we're able to see here is that gas furnace is, is probably still under warranty by the time their primary cooling system failed. And so now the homeowner has this option of retaining their gas furnace, but upgrading their cooling and part of their heating system to this dual fuel system. And all the while being able to take it up to just shy of 19 CR2 with a high levels of COP. Uh, so this dual fuel system, these technologies, again, they've been out for, for a lot of years, but we're starting to see them take hold in ways that uh, maybe they haven't in the past. Uh, and in markets that they haven't been they haven't been taking hold of in the past as well. We're, we're starting to see that change um, in, uh, in consumer buying habits. So dual fuel is a great option. It gives that ultimate uh, heating choice there with, uh, with the gas, whether it be propane, natural gas, or oil, I guess, depending how far north you go. Um, but the majority of the time we're seeing in the high 90s, 98, 99% of the time, it's going to be running off of that heat pump and not having to switch over to gas. Um, but the system is going to intelligently watch that as the electricity rates change or need to be changed or your, your gas rates change, this can all be adjusted and inputted. Uh, and now we're able to let the equipment choose what is the most efficient use of money, whether that be through electricity in the heat pump or if it needs to bring on the gas as we get colder and colder outside. So really intelligent piece of equipment, but we're able to, again, to leverage the benefits of gas and electricity for heating with, uh, without either of the cons of the two. Would like to walk through uh, this comparison here, this heating type comparison chart. Um, so there's a, a little bit of, of math going on, but I did try to simplify it the best I could. Um, so when we look at these cost comparisons, we're, we're assuming a three ton load for this home or 36,000 BTUs an hour is what what we're needing to properly heat that house. So when we look at a gas furnace, we look at our cost of, uh, of natural gas and we see the most common uh, furnace that would be uh, designed for a three ton system to get our cooling efficiencies and and other size re restraints, uh, typically we're gonna see a 60,000 BTU gas furnace that is optioned in. Um, and when we look at the most common of that 60,000 BTU, it's gonna be an 80% AFUE. Um, so 80% of 60,000 is 48,000. Um, so it's showing that we need, uh, we need just a little bit of gas to get up to that 48,000 BTUs worth of heat output. Now it's worth, worth uh, also discussing uh, as we went through the COP score, AFUE is going to be that gas equivalency. Um, so when we talk about an 80% AFUE, it means that 80% is going to heat the home and 20% is getting exhausted out. And now there are much more efficient gas systems out there, uh, well into the, the mid to high 90s. Um, but again, the most common that we see is still an 80% here in Texas. 
as we see down there, that run cost, we're going to look at the gas needed, uh, the BTUs needed to hit that 36,000. Uh, and so we get a, a dollar and 62 uh, per hour of run cost. Then we see if we're heating for two hours a day, we get down to $3.24. As our daily uh, gas cost, we extrapolate that out over a 30 day period and we're getting $97.20. Now, again, are we going to heat every day for two hours all the time? No, this is just given some averages and showing uh, comparisons. When we look at resistance heating, and we show an average of 15 cents per kilowatt hour uh, delivered cost here in Texas, and we see that per kilowatt, we're getting roughly 3,400 BTUs of heat. And so when we see the same three ton system, more common heat strips uh, or, heat, or heating option here is gonna be a 10 kilowatt heater, uh, which is gonna give us just again, just about 34,000 BTUs worth of heat. Our efficiency COP is, is one. Uh, so for the heat, the heat that we're putting in, we're getting again, one out of it. Um, so again, we're needing 10 kilowatts to run. So we see this run cost coming down, $1.59, uh, daily cost 318 with our monthly heating cost 90, 95.29. Again, these are some averages. Um, so this isn't showing that this is everybody's exact <laughs> exact bill, uh, but we can see uh, we can see some some similarities here with gas and resistance heat as far as the cost goes. Now, if we compare that to a high efficiency heat pump, again, this is going to be a variable speed system with a COP of just 3.5. And we saw earlier that there are systems that are much higher than that. Uh, but we're seeing that our run cost is simply 45 cents using the same heating hours. Uh, our monthly heating cost is down to 28.88. So significantly less than that resistance heat. And, and even still with the gas furnace, we're able to use that, uh, that heating more efficiently or that, that that money we're spending a little bit more efficiently. Now, again, this, this is going to assume that higher efficiency score, right? And so if we do, or, or if we are just putting in a simple heat pump that may have to drop off of your, um, of your high levels of COP around that 45 or 32 degree mark, yeah, now we're getting back into that resistance heat where we're starting to see these high heating costs. Um, and as we see the, the rates vary, whether it be electrical or, or gas, uh, we can see that uh, then in heating, it may actually be our most expensive utility month of the year. And, and in fact, in, in prior homes I've lived, that was the case, that January, February was my most expensive cost to, uh, to power the home. And it came from me having a resistance heater uh, inside of the space and not, uh, not a high efficiency heat pump that we can see here. Hey, Garrett. Yes, sir. Just real quick, back on the other slide, there's a question here, or just a kind of a comment, and then a question. Talking about the natural gas cost seems to be a bit high for that 360 per okay. CCF, and it, do you know where that came from? Yeah, that came from, um, uh, that came actually from one of my colleagues who lives just outside of Houston. That came off of his bill. Got it. Thank you. Sure thing. So moving, moving on from there, um, again, coming back to this heat pump and homeowners index, um, we see uh, we see when we when we looked prior that we had that majority of homeowners who were excited about HVAC, but we had that that disparity when it came to heat pumps. Um, we see that less than a quarter of homeowners have a heat pump installed in their home currently. Uh, while just shy of 70% would consider installing one for their next upgrade. Uh, however, we also broke that out a step further and looked at what is going to prevent them or what possibly could be preventing them from considering a heat pump when they do change out that, that system. And it gives us quite a bit of uh, interesting information here. And there's these top four that I want to talk about for a second, um, which is this cost of installing being the highest, but we also see cost of operating being 9%. Um, that comes a lot to do with the, with the understanding of COP as we've been talking about. And again, I think it's a, a, something that the industry has kind of done to itself that we've done a very good job of talking about SEER and EER to, a, to even a lesser degree and HSPF. Uh, but COP is something that oftentimes gets left out and is not talked about nearly enough at the kitchen table and in the industry as it should be. 
Um, and so we see we see this cost of operating uh, clicking up there, but the cost of installation, um, while these systems are very high end, the cost of that is not normally uh, going to be exponentially higher. Um, but again, it's an education piece, and we need to help under we need to help educate homeowners to make these proper decisions. There is going to be a higher cost than your base level system, no doubt. Uh, but there there's a, some again some education that we can see there. We look down at the second one that that where they're not seeing the need. So 17% are not seeing the need. And I think, again, this comes to, to not knowing the benefits of it. They're not seeing the efficiency gain, the heating gain, the, the comfort level that they're seeing in the home. These things aren't being discussed. Uh, so they see, well, you know, I've got a, I have a resistance heater. I have a gas furnace. Uh, I'm not needing a heat pump. And again, while they can keep both of those options and still have heat pumps, uh, giving that, that education of, even in these shoulder times where, where homeowners may have uh, maybe have become accustomed to adding an extra jacket or letting the heat not come on for until it gets a little bit too cold in the home and, and there's some complaints in there, uh, we can see that changing where they can actually be more comfortable in their home for less money year round. Um, and then that third section there, that 16% that had a concern of its ability to heat their home. I, I really believe that this comes uh, from prior technology, the stuff of, of yesteryear. Again, when, when I was first coming up in the industry and the, the more common heat pumps that we saw, we were almost required at about 45 degrees uh, to shut the heat pump off and have it use just resistance heating at that point. Um, and so when we, when we talk about that and people or homeowners become accustomed to it, uh, now what we start seeing is that, oh, well, heat pumps can't heat when it gets too cold or when it gets below 40 or 45 or, or down below freezing. Um, and that's where they, we, they get concerned about. And when we, we overlay that with these extreme storms that we've had over the past couple of years and Storm Uri and the snowpocalypse or the ice storms that we've seen, uh, this ability to heat their home really can start to climb up. And it only shows 16% here. Uh, but I'd venture to say that that number is, uh, is, can climb, especially during these peak seasons that, that we see. One that, um, that was a little interesting uh, or surprising was the ability to cool the home. Um, and now this probably comes from the fact that when we're talking about heat pumps, the first word in that phrase or that name is heat. Uh, we never talk about cool pumps or AC pumps, right? They're, uh, they're always heat pumps. And so there is this, while it's a, a small percentage, it's still a percentage that needs to be addressed, um, that there's a, a concern that the heat pump can't cool their home. Uh, all it does is, uh, is heat. And so luckily, uh, heat pumps are, are air conditioners as well. They, they can provide air conditioning. And so uh, again, talking about this, I don't know if there's really a, a way to change the term heat pump, but also making a point to, to specify that, that heat pumps specifically all climate high efficiency heat pumps um, are going to be high efficient AC systems as well that can go into home uh, into homes. Now, when we, when we, hey, take a step, yes, sir. Sorry, just real quick. There's a lot of questions coming up. I'll just go through uh, real sure. quick. One of them was um, the chart you had prior uh, says, was that sourced for the entire U S or are you just kind of talking regionally with Texas? Uh, sorry. So, what what chart are we talking about? The are we looking at uh, at this one here? Yes, I believe so. Uh, yeah. So th this was um, this was a U.S. study. Uh, so yeah, all, all encompassing there. Okay, got it. Was there any other questions, or was that the only one? Uh, well, if you can speak to this just real quick, it says, what about ground source heat pumps? How do they compare to air source heat pumps? And are ground source heat pumps a viable option for Austin, which is climate zone 2A? So that's going to be, um, yeah, I guess, a little bias, right? Because we, here at Mitsubishi, we sell air source heat pumps, um, right? So um, a little bit more bias there. Now, I've seen some great success with ground source products, and they're, I think, for the most part, they're very efficient. Um, I don't know, I couldn't speak to their reliability, their longevity, um, retrofit options. I think there's a lot of things that go into that that, um, 
uh, could really drive that cost up. Um, but unfortunately, again, I, I don't have enough uh, enough experience on the ground source part of things to really dive into that much deeper. Got it. And then one last thing here. Um, do you know much about doing the energy models for this? It says, do energy models such as IC3, which is a free one from Texas A&M, do they give the option for COP versus HSPF or is it HSPF and then you convert it or something or vice versa? Uh, that I'd have to look into a little bit deeper and I'd be, I'd be happy to uh, to follow back up on that one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so kind of stepping through where we talked about heat pumps uh, can also provide AC and I think again that's a very important topic to, to bring up to homeowners. Um, as we, we talk about cost, that is going to, uh, to always be top of mind for a lot of people. Um, this is just a quick graph showing what's been happening over the, the past, uh, past several years, past uh, decade or more. Uh, but we, we've seen that uh, historically um, that HVAC systems or equipment were increasing at about 3% a year. When we look at March of 22, they were up 20% compared to the year before. And now with the new refrigerant transition that's coming later this year, Hardy is estimating it up to a 20% increase over existing equipment prices. Um, and so we're really seeing that the cost of equipment, whether that be uh, conventional or variable speed is starting to increase at a, uh, at a pretty substantial rate. And we're gonna talk, I wanna talk about some ways that that's changing the buying habits of homeowners, but it's important to look at what we're going to see here in the future. And again, why a high efficiency has probably been on the top of people's mind to try to help with that ROI. Uh, also part of that study, what we saw was that 71% uh, of homeowners have indicated they have a thermostat war in their home. Uh, when, uh, when half of the home is wanting to have uh, 65 to 69, the other half could be 70 to 75. Um, and this is going to then extrapolate more as, as there might be children or others that are living inside of the home and, and you're having even more uh, preferences that are having to be, um, be worked around. And so what we see is that the idea of having smaller zoned off systems where you can get some more comfort or more direct comfort out of these spaces uh, becomes a lot more appealing to a lot of homeowners. They're not having to waste money. Uh, cooling or heating a space they're not being that's not being used but they also have enough on tap uh, where there is a heavy load and that could be in a in a laundry room where you've got your washer and dryer or other things going on there uh, while that's going on you you might want to be cooling it but during the the off time where you're not actively cleaning the the laundry or the system those units aren't running you don't need to be cooling or, or dedicating power uh, in that area nearly as much and same goes to uh, to dining rooms, bedrooms, and the like, we, we can see that this, this individualized comfort becomes a lot more appealing for these smaller systems. Uh, a big um, barrier to that has been the aesthetics. Um, and now with, with products like this one, you can see that, that that ductless air handler is mounted there in the ceiling, uh, which really does not take away from the aesthetics of the space. Uh, but is able to, to give that, that individualized comfort there in the kitchen while, uh, while it's, it's family night and they're, they're prepping dinner or lunch or whatever that might be. So there's multiple options to help people get past their, their concerns. We see that, um, that market trend, this is a, a, from a, another study from the Farmington Group uh, that we saw this unitary uh, purchases were decreasing while many slits were increasing at the same rate. Um, and then some projections there of that where, where again, people are moving more to the, the ductless side of things um, and away from, from more unitary ducted systems. Uh, talking a little bit about automated response or demand response here, um, while this, this can be seen or used as a, as a last resort, I think it's important to know that we're effectively playing whack-a-mole with it. Uh, when, the, when the demand goes up, we have to react. But if we're able to convert these systems from conventional to variable, um, now we're able to start reducing that, that load uh, immediately and permanently off the grid. We're not having to have these, uh, these whack-a-mole sessions. Um, and again, representing that, that when we have our old conventional system and it, there's a call for, for cooling, we see the compressor is coming on and off and it's ramping, it goes straight to 100 and then it drops down. Whereas we have a variable system, that same, that same call for cooling and it's going to 
spike up, it's going to get where it needs, and then it's going to be riding that comfort wave. Um, and so when we overlay these together, it's it's pretty obvious to see what the what the more desirable choices from both comfort um, and from a uh, energy consumption standpoint really stands. Um, and then I think homeowners are starting to ask the question as well. So while while that might be um, you know not everybody's response or or reaction, I know that um, when I've walked the dogs outside even at night, uh, you hear a lot of AC condensers that are that are slamming on. It's very loud, um, and I think having a more quiet neighborhood or even just the backyard would be uh, would be a lot of people's desire. Again, we see that um, that they're very good air conditioners, and we're we're kind of transitioning away from heat, talking about more of the cooling side. Um, that this um, this website shows some graphs given uh, current efficiency to new efficiency. And so when we see that an all climate heat pump and we're, we're averaging that 18 SEER 2 mark off of a, of a prior minimum, which is 14, again, at a three ton, we can see that we're saving roughly 35% uh, per year. And we extrapolate that out to a 10 year savings and it's just shy of $2,200 that uh, the homeowners could be saving their electricity costs over their current system. But again, it's worth noting that, um, that not all heat pumps are made the same. And so if we were doing base to base or minimums to minimum, which was 14 and is now 14.3, we're seeing very, just a very small savings. So it's less than $500 a year over 10 years, um, which it would not necessarily justify the cost increase uh, from a current system to a new one, uh, given that, um, that same idea. And when we see that uh, the, the Texas grid, uh, we're seeing these peaks continue to climb from 22 to 23. Um, and we're seeing on, on the higher end that five gigawatts more power was needed during these peak times. And we see the graph past that, that it only continues to climb thereafter. Um, so we expect these, um, as more people move in, as more electricity is needed in these homes, if we're not using high efficiency systems, we're just using electric systems, we're, we're going to be running into that challenge. Um, and so it's, it's worth noting that we need to be a little bit smarter about what we're doing. One of the ways we can do that um, is through the load calculations and, and where the mechanical systems are located. So we see these top five inputs for loads with number four there being the mechanical system location. This was a, a design that was done uh, here in Austin. And we see that uh, the only difference is taking the mechanicals out of an unconditioned space and putting them into a conditioned space. And this is still in incorporating ductwork, but if we were able to remove the ductwork as well, we'd see even more of a dramatic drop. Um, and so it's really important, I think, for us to look at how systems are being built. When I say a system, I'm talking the airflow delivery, the, the mechanicals, uh, the, really the house as a system to where everything is being located so to maximize efficiency of these electrical products uh, and again not just um, not just deal with the, the the minimums that we can have when we look at uh, at ductwork there's a lot of homes that have ductwork that look just like this or even unfortunately worse um, where the the ducts are not run they're they're pretty poorly strapped with, uh, with zip ties there. Insulation is falling off. Um, and you've got some directly exposed uh, ductwork there that, that is just straight to the attic. Um, and I'd venture to say that there's a number of air gaps in this system as well if we're starting to see it degrade like this. Um, and when we look at refrigerant, transferring heat better than air, um, it's roughly 8,000% more efficient to transfer heat uh, via refrigerant than it is air. Um, so we, we can be a little bit smarter about how, again, we, we're moving heat or, uh, or transferring heat from place to place inside of the home. And even when we have a more, um, a, a better designed or a better installed system, we still have these deck runs that we have to, to put everywhere. We still have to deal with these potential air losses and and these gaps, we have to take these, these measures to try to remove that or minimize those gaps and those, those losses as, cap as possible. Um, but we also see that ductwork adds 25% on average to the cooling load of the system or to the home. So if we're able to start moving away from ducted equipment uh, to ductless systems, which is shown there on the right, uh, one of those one-way cassettes, 
uh, as, a, as a home is being built, that we see that there is no ductwork that's being run to that, that air handler, and it's able to handle the entire room that it's in. Um, so where you might have had to have one, two, or three ducts run to that space, we can eliminate those altogether and, and really gain a lot of efficiency, uh, not just from being able to utilize uh, the refrigerant, but also to remove the ductwork. So effectively being able to save uh, potentially 25% of the cooling load by simply just going all ductless away from, from ducted products. Um, and this is, comes from manufacturers that we, we are very proud of our ducted products um, and they serve a purpose. But if we can minimize the duct runs and how far they're going, not having a central spot with a with an octopus or a spider up in the attic that is uh, that's running these ducts 20, 30, 50 plus feet, we can really start to, to get a lot more efficient with the energy that we're using to, to heat and cool the home. So any ways we can incentivize this, uh, if we can incentivize um, a replacing of ductwork, not just enhancing it, but, but obsoleting it altogether, and going with ductless systems, I think we'll start seeing a lot more comfort and a lot more adoption of these high efficiency heat pumps versus just uh, sticking with what we've had in years past. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that, Garrett. And, and, you know, the way that that looks too is you could probably, depending on a two story, I guess you could model half the system as being within conditioned space if they're in the sub four, as that one on the right is. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, depending on how it's, how it's how the system is uh it, or how the home is built um either half of it or or even all of it depending could all be in condition space exactly right all right and then one question that just popped up he said can you briefly discuss air in air air filtration and maintenance with ductless systems yeah yeah that's a that is a great point um so filtration on them while the the filters and the ductless systems traditionally are going to be uh much thinner then, uh, then your unitary products that have more of that, that pleated or, uh, or different style of filter that could be a, a one, two, four, five, six inch big media filters. One of the benefits they do have is being able to, or they continuously operate. So the fans are always moving. We're always circulating air through the space. Um, so while you do need to clean that filter more frequently, it in theory is grabbing more of the pollutants out of the air uh, because that fan is always being run. And if we're if we're pairing that with either ERVs or dehumidifiers um, with uh, with different other IAQ solutions, it can really make a, a powerful partnership uh, to move and filter air continuously. So those those independent units there that actually has filters in them. Correct. Correct. It will have at least one. Uh, typically, you'll have uh, up to three different styles of filter that, that address certain aspects from odors to, uh, to dust and, and your normal uh, items that are trying to be filtered out of the air. Okay. And then one last question. So if that one on the right was on a ceiling that was basically into the attic, what's the best practice for installing that in a vented attic? Is it, would you build something around it, insulate or over it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, it, absolutely, I guess is the short answer that um, you know, these this style of uh, of system is really just being cut into the sheetrock, and as we can see, it's it's designed to fit below or between the the joists there. Um, but if it was into a vented attic, we'd need to follow the same considerations that we do with, uh, with any penetration, whether that be through a, a light or a, or a ductwork or whatever it might be, that having an enclosure, um, even a, a simplified um, insulated enclosure, whether that be through like a, um, an insulated board or, or duct board or some other type of insulation, um, that can that can seal up that penetration and also making an airtight seal as well. Um, so some things I've seen done is uh, is using the the zip sheathing uh, to make an enclosure that sits up there in the attic, um, and then it's fully sealed uh, down to the sheetrock and the other framing, and then that unit would then live inside of that enclosure uh, that's uh, then be accessible from underneath for homeowners or contractors for maintenance or repairs. And then you probably just, what, could you just insulate over the top of that enclosure? Absolutely. 
Okay. And then how often do those filters have to be changed? Yeah. So the, the simple option is as needed. Um, you know, we, we see that, uh, being at minimum 30 days, they need to be cleaned. Um, but it could be, uh, it could be more or less frequent just depending on the case use for it. Okay. And then last question, I know these standalone units like this, they don't have any type of uh, mechanical ventilation, fresh air systems. It's going to be one of those standalone ERVs, HRVs, or an independent box. Uh, so this specific unit that we're looking at here, that would be correct. We have other uh, ductless applications that do allow for uh, for fresh air intakes to be attached to them. Um, you know, in our in Central Texas, our climate area, it, they need to be tempered. They need to be go through a, a dehumidifier um, or, or dehumidifying ERV of some sort before it gets dumped into the coil. Um, but there are options to run. Uh, fresh air directly into these boxes, depending on the model that's selected. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, and, and kind of stepping into the next uh, yeah, segment here is, is really talking about some of those questions that just got brought up, which is these, these kitchen table conversations. Um, so highlighting a couple of here, but the question that just got asked are, are perfect ways to also discuss some of the differences um, and setting some of those expectations with homeowners. And so showing these here, the, the what, what are heat pumps? And I think that's, that's a discussion that needs to happen because when we see that, that homeowners are interested in HVAC, but maybe not in heat pumps, that's probably coming from a lack of, of education. Um, and when we see that homeowners aren't changing their HVAC system every year, um, and in fact, most homeowners uh, are only going to change their, their central system about twice in their lifetime. Um, and we see that from when people move, uh, when they have moved into a new home or built a new home. But going through the process of changing that system is, is less and less frequent uh, compared to other utilities or other appliances that they may be changing inside of their homes. And so their education level is gonna be significantly less on this. We really need to make sure we're, we're presenting all the options to them. So what are heat pumps? How do they work? And then the different types of heat pumps. Again, if we're, if we're talking back through those different options, are, um, are they going to have a, a more traditional system or more conventional system that's gonna be a lot of on off? Or are they gonna be able to tap into a variable system? Um, and so how are we, how we present that to homeowners can be in a couple of different ways. And um, two of my favorite analogies to use are, are this one here where you discuss a, a light switch um, that your conventional system is going to be just like a traditional light switch. It's either on or off. You get all the light or none of it. Um, if you have a, a staged piece of equipment, it's going to be more like a preset dimmer where you can uh, you have a high, medium and low or off, but you're kind of stuck in between those levels. But a true variable system is going to be like that dial. It's going to be that true dimmer where you can go from all the way at 100% and get all the light that you need, uh, or you can go all the way down to minimums and you're just uh, you're just getting exactly what you want or what you need out of the space. And so if you're watching a movie, you don't necessarily want to have the light on um, all the way, uh, but if you're having a party, you, you probably would. And so are you going to have that single that single stage light switch and you just have somebody over there that's flipping it on and off a bunch of times, or do you want that, that variable capacity where you can dial it in? The, the second analogy that's used, and I'm a big fan of, is, uh, is that of your, your water taps throughout the home. So your faucets and your other, other appliances are using water. It's, if you're doing the dishes in the kitchen, do you turn on every faucet in the, in the home, every, every garden hose, your sprinkler system, is everything running just because you need to use water in one spot? And traditionally, no, it's going to be just what you need. And then even taking a step past that, when you, when you are using a sink, uh, typically you're not going to put it all the way to cold or all the way to hot. Most people are going to want somewhere more in the middle where it's a little bit more warm or more comfortable to them. Um, and even, even still then, and once you get the desired temperature, you may not have it given you full blast of, of all the water pressure that can come out of that. It's going to be regulated down a little bit more. Um, and so we can have that same use out of our, out of our HVAC systems that we do out of our water faucets. Uh, but again, setting this, this tone for homeowners and, and others that there are options besides just having all or nothing 
Uh, we just have to select the right piece of equipment for it. Again, talking about our efficiency and performance gains, we need to, we, again, talking about SEER um, and, and our other traditional uh, efficiencies, but also looking at our COP scores. And again, talking about COP and, and why this matters. Um, and if we, uh, if we take a line back from the, the quick video we watched uh, with the builder discussing solar, will heat pumps, will variable speed, all climate heat pumps become less efficient uh, at lower temperatures, absolutely. But if we're setting the, the expectation, we're designing appropriately, again, even showing this one at negative 13, where we're still at 1.93 COP, that is a whole lot more appealing than a, than a one, or if we're using the AFUE conversion, a, a less than 1.8 potential comparison there. It really starts to show the differences and the efficiency gains that we can have out of the system. We also look at our, our comfort levels. Again, if we're gonna have power and we're gonna have this on off kind of proposition here, uh, we're gonna have that overcooling, undercooling, overheating, underheating. Um, and so you're, you're gonna have those swings in temperature versus just being able to have it ride that, that wave and being uh, significantly more comfortable no matter the situation, indoor, outdoor, it's gonna be able to, to adjust as is needed. We talk about that to, uh, to the incentives, which we're going to look at here in the next couple of slides. The value of that system starts to become a, a, a lot more appealing to homeowners. If we're just going in and saying, oh yeah, this, this system is a lot more expensive, but we're not diving into why it, it may be more expensive and all the true benefits that they're getting out of it, we're, we're leaving a lot on the table. And, and truth be told, we're going to have a lot of homeowners um, who are just going to look at, at that dollar amount. And if we're not educating them on what that dollar amount actually is costing them, uh, we're going to miss out again on a lot of opportunity to, to convert people from a traditional heat pump uh, or a straight cooling system over to a variable speed high efficiency system. Talking about uh, efficiency and rebates, um, you know, the IRA is something that, uh, that I'm sure we're we're all intimately familiar with at this point. Um, and while not all of the, the money has been released, um, there is some, some important dates that I did want to pass along um, that, um, uh, that have, been, uh, have been made public here not too long ago. Um, so just to kind of bring everybody up to speed on where we are with it. Uh, so if you're not familiar with them, there's three main important dates that uh, we've been waiting for or, or kind of we've been actively working towards or the state has and, and us in industry have been uh, eagerly anticipating these dates or, or announcements before that. Uh, so the first one is May 21st of this year. That's the administrative funding deadline. Um, so that is money that has been set aside through the IRA to allow states to build out their teams, their departments. Uh, to, uh, to work through the, the proverbial red tape and, uh, and apply for funding if that's the direction they choose to go, um, and also see how that funding is going to then be spent and be applied in the state. Um, so recently, Texas did, uh, did indicate that they are going to apply for that, or they, they plan to apply for that administrative funding before the deadline of May 21st, uh, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, and then as a, um, effectively as a default, they would not be moving forward uh, with the next date, which is August 16th, uh, which is when they have to uh, provide an intent to apply for the homes and the HERA funding that's available. Um, and so indicated by the state, if they're moving forward or because they're moving forward with the administrative uh, funding request, that then by default is, uh, is them saying that they plan to uh, apply for the remainder of the money through homes and, and HERA there before or on August 16th of this year. Now, once they've provided that, uh, that intent to apply, they have until January 31st of 2025 to actually get the application in. Um, so as we, um, uh, as we get closer to these deadlines um, and these applications be put in, we'll, we'll be, um, again, anxiously awaiting for, uh, for some movement here. Um, but currently we're, we're still kind of in that waiting game for these, these, uh, large sums to be made available to us. But what we do have right now is a 25 C tax credit. Um, and so this is a federal based program, um, that is going to provide 30% of the cost of the heat pump up to a maximum of $2,000. 
Um, and it can be, or it's going to be used to offset their tax liabilities. This isn't a point of purchase discount. It is going to be taken at their, uh, uh, on their taxes. Um, and so it really is one of those things that we need to be educating homeowners that the equipment may be qualified for 25C. And that's really what we need to be taking it. Uh, but they do need to consult with their tax preparer uh, to make sure that everything gets followed and they, they file as is needed. Now, we do publish... Uh, and keep published a list of qualifying products on our website. Um, and so that is able to be found uh, just on MitsubishiComfort.com um, forward slash IRA. And that will take, uh, take you to those qualifying product page. Uh, and again, be able to help provide homeowners with all the options that they have. Because uh, not everything qualifies, but a lot of stuff does. Past, uh, past the retro piece for homeowners, uh, there is also a builder and contractor incentive. Um, so this is 45L and we can see it actually gets very enticing uh, there on the far right. So multifamily dwellings uh, can be up to $2,500 per unit that meets Energy Star standards and $5,000 per unit for zero efficiency ready units. Um, there's some conditions there and, and I encourage you if you're, if you're in this realm to look through there. Um, but we do see a good amount of money that can be used in multifamily and then single family the same way up to that same $2,500 and $5,000 options for zero energy ready homes. Uh, so again, a lot of money that can be tapped into um, to encourage this adoption of all climate, high efficiency, variable speed heat pumps. Garrett? Garrett? Yes, sir. Just a quick question. I don't know, uh, you may be able to answer this a little bit better. So you talked about the IRA funding money and I know part of that is rebates. So is that stackable with the 25C and then the rebates if that goes through in Texas? Are they able to stack those to take? Uh, so my understanding is that it's, it's going to be a one or, or the other uh, kind of proposition. Uh, now, they are targeted at two different groups. Um, so the, the 25C uh, mark is, again, off of uh, the tax liability. So this is not a creditable um, amount. So if you, if at the end of the year you owed zero taxes, you're probably not going to have uh, the ability to tap into this money here. Again, that's the refer back to that line of, of consult with your tax preparer for all the, the regulations there. Um, the, the credit piece of it, what we're really looking forward to is the up to $8,000 for low to moderate income families. Um, and so this is going to be up to 80% of uh, or they'll get the full 8,000 if they get up to 80% of the uh, median income for their zip code. Um, and then they can get up to 4,000 at a reduced, or they can actually get the full eight, but it's at a, with some reduced um, regulations or there's some enhanced regulations, I guess they have to tap into the full money. It's only going to be about 50% at the same level uh, for higher earners. Um, so more than likely we're going to see some, uh, where it's not stackable, and again, it's targeting two different uh, groups of, of homeowners with these programs. Transitioning a little bit um, from heat pumps, and just to maybe kind of paint uh, paint a little bit of a different picture here for a moment. We look at um, EVs, and a record 1.2 million of them were sold in uh, in the U.S. in 2023. And now, just kind of bear with me for a minute here. As we uh, as we dive into it, because no, this is not an electric vehicle uh, presentation, but I think it's worth noting some things here and some buying trends that we're seeing. Um, and that four out of the top five best selling vehicles in the U.S. have an EV option, um, and we see that Ford and Chevrolet um, there with their their trucks are the number one and two, um, and then we have Tesla, which is uh, you know just an uh, all electric only company, and their Model Y being um, the number five best-selling vehicle in the U.S. So we can see some trends that this would not be the case if people were, were not interested in electric vehicles or electrification or strategic electrification, as we kind of discussed. We take that a step further and we look at what other brands, um, this is just a small snapshot of brands that um, have indicated by 2035, they're going to be all EV. And I, again, we see Chevrolet, GMC, the GM product lines. We also see uh, Lexus, Mercedes-Benz, Mini, Volvo. So there's a, a, a huge gambit of your, your more affordable choices to your higher end options being all EV 
uh, by this 2035. And you may be asking, why does that matter? How does that affect heat pumps? And in short, we, we should start selling heat pumps like Tesla. So if you go on to, to buy a Model Y right now and you, you go through the, the little configurator, it's going to start populating these prices. And so we see this vehicle price uh, that populates at 43.9. Then you have your federal tax credits, your estimated savings for fuel. Uh, then you have your price after tax credit and your price after probable savings. And so we can see that that $43,990 vehicle um, is shown as their, their true cost or true price all said and done over those three years as being 32,890. So about $11,000 less uh, than the, the actual purchase price of the vehicle. Now, whether or not you believe in, in all that, that's been very effective for Tesla and being able to show, again, their savings and their efficiencies um, and, and probably better than any other automaker has in recent history. So if we, if we use that and we start looking at heat pumps and how can we, how can we mimic some of this, this uh, performance that they've had in showing, in showing consumers what they can receive, we start seeing that a heat pump, let's say that this system is going to be 12,500 to be installed. We estimate our 10-year electrical savings uh, at uh, 2,819. We have our federal tax credit, that's the 25C at 2,000. Uh, in this case, we'd have a local energy credit of $750, and that's shown on the right there through our rebate finder that uh, that product would qualify for an Austin energy rebate of $750. Um, so we're seeing our price after credits of $9,750 and our price after probable savings being $6,931. Again, so we're, we're effectively showing that, yes, that heat pump, there is going to be an upfront cost, and you, it's going to be probably a little bit higher than, um, than the last system that that homeowner had purchased. Um, and it's, it's going to be more expensive than your baseline equipment as well. But when we start looking into your electrical savings, your credits that are uh, available, both local and federal, um, and we, we calculate all that out, that effective 10-year cost on that system uh, is actually going to be close to that $6,900 mark versus the true 12.5. And again, this isn't to mislead homeowners, it's just to educate them on, on these, these prices after probable savings. CEER is something that's always been really difficult for homeowners to quantify in savings. And even when we talk about COP and we talk about these efficiency numbers and these percentages above and below, and we're 400% more efficient uh, or whatever that metric is, putting it in dollars and cents is, um, is the most effective way to, to educate homeowners on the true performance and savings of this equipment. And so doing something similar to this can be very beneficial. Uh, again, plugging our rebate finder uh, on our consumer facing site, which is MitsubishiComfort.com. Uh, there is a rebate finder that homeowners or, or yourselves can use. Simply type in your zip code and it'll show you all the qualifying products in that area uh, and what programs they qualify for. So it's a very useful tool for, for homeowners to be using. But again, if we're, we start selling key pumps like Tesla, um, then we'll, uh, we'll be in a pretty good, uh, pretty good state over the next couple of years. Okay, kind of coming to the end, there's a few things I wanted to summarize and, um, and, and do some key takeaways and we'll get to the kind of open questions up. Um, so all climate heat pumps, uh, they're, they are the future, and, and frankly, the future is here today. We're seeing this change. We saw it with, uh, with heat pumps outpacing gas furnaces back in 22, and then that, that uh, lead expanded even further into 23. Uh, with, the, with the funding right around the corner, there's no sign of this slowing down. With the, the energy demand, the grid continuously uh, having more, more and more load on it, Again, the need for this stuff is even more prevalent now than it has been even, even yesterday or the day before or the year before. We do need to be educating homeowners uh, on heat pump technology and the differences of heat pumps from traditional and conventional to, to variable speed. Uh, and it's also worth noting that, um, that we can't just rely on the term inverter because that can be misleading. You could have a two-stage inverter system and that's going to lose a lot of the benefits of a true variable speed system that's run with an inverter as well. So educating homeowners has to be paramount in heat pump technology, not just heat pumps in general, but truly the differences that we see. 
Um, one thing that comes up a lot is, um, is designers, uh, homeowners, contractors, anybody who's involved with it needed to be comfortable with the heating component of a heat pump. Um, and what I mean by that is when we look at the COP scores and the performance numbers, they can seem almost unreal. Um, they almost make believe, but they're tested, they're practiced, they're proven. Um, and so we need to be, we need to be comfortable with not optioning in heat strips as if we don't need them. We don't, we need to be sizing appropriately, but we can rely on the technology that exists with these all climate heat pumps without having to revert to the resistance backup options um, and really making that, that switch over. I think, again, if we talk about, uh, make some comparisons to, to EVs and others, there's that idea that, you know, the, the battery would only ever be able to go 10 miles without needing to be charged. And now we have them that go much further. And so it's really just getting comfortable and, and showing the technology around heat pumps that we have today um, and what's coming out in the, in the very short future. When we look at programs and incentives, uh, we need to be specifying those around high efficient, all climate heat pumps. Um, they need to be variable systems. They can't, again, just be regular heat pumps. That's going to do a disservice to homeowners um, and the grid as a whole. So really having that, that uh, specification of it being a high efficient variable speed system to get these program incentives needs to be paramount. Um, and we're, we're seeing some good direction move that way, um, but that's going to really help to, uh, to separate uh, the older technology from the new stuff. Again, we can also adapt some ductwork programs to incentivize ductless equipment. Uh, so there are programs that exist currently and there's, there's options that exist now um, for, uh, for upgrading uh, ductwork, maybe from an R6 to an R8 value. Um, and there is even some options to, to obsolete ductwork altogether, but not all the programs are, are written in that way uh, to take full advantage of it. But the example here would be if we're going to add a ductless system into a uh, into a kitchen or or into a living space or whatever that might be, and we can obsolete 20, 30 feet of ductwork, whether that be an R6 or an R8, we should be able to tap into the same incentives, if not more, because we're going to be more efficient with the electricity we're using uh, and not have the heat loss that comes from ductwork. The last thing that um, really have been have been pressing here recently is for for everybody in the industry uh, regardless of the role that you play to take the heat pump pledge and um, the idea with this is a is find ways to move heat pumps into areas that otherwise may not be talked about um, now ideally this is going to be a variable speed system it's going to be an all climate system uh, but if it is a dual fuel application if it's water heaters if it's ductless equipment uh, there are options with heat pumps today that will get into any application that, uh, that needs to be there, whether that be in a commercial, residential, new construction, retrofits uh, for, for high earners, low to moderate income. There's, there's options for everybody to have a heat pump in their homes and their businesses um, and really take advantage of all the benefits that we've gone through today. So I'd encourage you if you're, again, no matter what role you play, uh, in the industry to take that heat pump pledge and encourage others to do the same. Randy, that's come to the end of, of my presentation. So um, open it for any questions and uh, kind of turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. I appreciate it. So you, you answered the majority of what we went through. Um, I can't agree with you more on a lot of stuff. I went through the same thing with my dad trying to change out to a heat pump. He's used to the heat pump of old. And he immediately said, yeah. no, he had electric resistance heat. And I said, you don't really have a choice. Um, <laughs> and he went with it and has been happy ever since. What we did run into is the contractor that installed it. Um, well, that and my personal house, changing out my system is having the right person that does the installation to set the equipment up correctly is key as well. So if it's variable speed, multi-stage, uh, I've heard a lot of horror stories where people just they think they got what they paid for, and it turned out it was only wired up and set in as a single stage, even though the equipment was capable of it. Yep. So it's key to know that it's been done right. The only thing really that's still left out here, there's a, uh, actually there's two more. One says, and you might have answered this on the slide we had earlier, but are train mini split units just rebranded Mitsubishi units? <laughs> 
Um, it, so I, what I will say is anything that we make, that Mitsubishi makes, will have our logo on it. It'll have that three diamond um, logo. If it's not there, then we didn't make it. Um, so if it is a trained product or it's a trained branded system and we made it, it'll also have our logo. If not, then they had somebody else make it. That's a great way to find out. And then Robert asked, what is the difference using single unit per zone rather than a multi-zone system for eight zones? Yeah, so I mean, it's a it's certainly a pro-con uh, comparison when you start getting into larger zone homes or applications. Um, a lot of it has to do with the case use uh, and the the rely or the the redundancy of it. So if you're if the home or the space is going to be used more or less the same, uh, where what I mean by that is you don't have um, potentially a, an elder parent that is living with you that may want to have the temperature significantly warmer or want, want to have heat while the rest of the family or the home is wanting cooling. Uh, that typically is what we see the most uh, is where the, the state of heating or cooling is going to be determined by the outdoor unit, not the indoors. Um, so how you're using it is a good way to split it off. Um, we also see, again, some levels of redundancy that if you have the available space and power um, from a cost standpoint, it's, it, it's almost marginal um, to have multiple outdoor systems. So you do have some redundancy. Even with this equipment being extremely reliable, it's never a bad idea to have some redundancy in our homes. Um, and then the third piece of it, that's, a, again, another comparison is the structure itself. Um, so are you going to have a, is it a single story home or property, or is it a two or three or four story town home? Um, typically what we like to see is a, is a metering device or outdoor system by floor. So whether that be through a branch box or mixing box, um, or through a dedicated outdoor unit per floor. Um, again, a lot of this is not, uh, it has to be one way or the other. It's really just to get the most performance out of every application. Got it. And then these two kind of work together. One is, is there a certain contractor certificate that is recommended? And then Gu Guadalupe actually mentioned that back in the day, uh, there used to be a training program with Mitsubishi called uh, the Diamond Dealer. Is that still out there today? And is that part of a certificate that you would recommend for the contractor to have? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, exactly right. Um, you know, if we're talking specific to Mitsubishi products, then yes, we do have our, our Diamond Contractor Duckless Pro uh, programs, and they're, among everything else, training is the most paramount to being a, a dealer inside of those programs. Um, while I can't speak to the specifics of other manufacturers, I guarantee that they have similar programs um, that exist, and so other certifications or or um, or badging would would be there as well. But if we're talking about our specific, um, you know, some of our top dealers, there's quite a bit of training they go to. Um, so it's up to 48 hours of continuing ed per year that becomes required for those dealers. Um, so what I would encourage if we're talking about our product specific, which hopefully that is a little bias there, um, to speak with your, your distributor of choice, um, and they'd be able to get you either in contact with me or whoever that might be serving your, your company or your area and go over the specific requirements of it. Um, while the technology is new, we really want to make sure that, um, that you are educated on every little in, instance that there could be. Um, cause Randy, like you were saying, the biggest pitfall we see is not the technology is not even really technicians knowing how to work on the technology. Um, cause it's relatively straightforward, but a lot of times it comes down to the design and the application of what's there, what, what programming is set, what dip switches are set, not making it a single stage, letting it fully vary. Um, but also you have duct work you have to consider, you have load you have to consider. And so we go through a lot of that stuff as well to make sure that, um, that our homeowners are getting the best product and the contractors are set up for the highest level of success. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Great answer. Um, Robert did ask, and I hope I asked this question correctly. He said, what, if any, are there drawbacks with multiple uh, multi-zone systems and open doors? He put ceiling systems for narrow joist, joists, such as less than 24 inch on center. Well, so I guess it depends. And, and, um, 
if I'm understanding this correctly, and so I'm going to, I'm going to try to answer it, Robert, if, if not, um, certainly ask it again, maybe a different way, but um, so we've got on the residential uh, side of things, there's four different chassis sizes of ductless in ceiling options um, that range anywhere from a 33 by 33 square um, that would obviously need a pretty large uh, framing opening uh, for it, but that can service a very large space and even have a little jumper duct to go to an attached uh, bathroom or other areas. All the way down to a one-way uh, cassette system that can go in between a 14 and a half inch uh, off-center pre-manufactured I-beam. Um, so it really just depends on the application that you have. Um, so whether it's your traditional joists that are 16 off-center, uh, the I beams, or if you have just all the room in the in the world, um, it, it really comes down to the application. So hopefully that answered your question on the sizing. Um, you know, talking about other drawbacks, I mean, you think about every system or every every air handler, you're going to have a, a maintenance cycle with. So if you have eight zones in a home, you're going to have a maintenance cycle for the outdoor, and you're going to have eight different maintenance cycles uh, for the inside. So maybe changing one filter that you're used to, now you're going to have eight that you have to clean, or you have eight different wheels you have to clean uh, or, or otherwise service. So there's just a, a little bit more service requirement just because you have physically more equipment in the space. That's that's great. Yeah, he says 14 is good. Thanks on that. Appreciate that. And I didn't think about it that way, but that you're right, those maintenance cycles can add up quickly. Uh, I did miss half of Jorge's question. He basically says, if you can speak to this, um, for the train and Mitsubishi units, what countries are they currently being manufactured in? Yeah, um, so it, it depends on the line. Um, so when it, you know, when it comes to Mitsubishi product, all of the stuff we make um, will come out of the same facilities and then it's effectively a different sticker if it's a train branded or American Standard or, or just a Mitsubishi branded product. Um, they're made either in Japan, uh, where most of our, that's where our, our global headquarters is out of. Mitsubishi is a Japanese owned company. Um, we also have um, our largest global facility that we get about 15% of our total product from uh, that comes out of Thailand. Um, and then our largest producer is, uh, is in Mexico. So Mexicali, just on the other side of San Diego, where we get uh, the lion's share of products. Um, it's also probably worth noting that Mitsubishi Electric, we make a lot more than just heating and cooling products. Um, we have our hands in just about everything and we go to Mitsubishi Holdings, which is, and now we start incorporating the motors and, and other aspects of it. Um, so one thing we're able to do is leverage our manufacturing abilities from other industries and bring that same R&D over into this product line that we have. Um, so that might be where we, we make electric motors for wind turbines or, or um, uh, cars or whatever that looks like. Um, we're able to, or electric generators, I guess, for the turbines or whatever that looks like, we're now able, able to simplify that uh, down into our fan motors and be a very efficient uh, use of shared R&D. Uh, same is true with the compressor technology, the refinement of the, of the ores. Um, we make a large percentage of everything in our unit. So it's less than 1% of things we're actually outsourcing. We, we manufacture just everything in our units. Um, again, even to the raw, down to the raw materials that we're able to source from, from our other uh, uh, Mitsubishi partners. Um, so again, the, the main three, Japan, Thailand, and Mexico. Uh, there are a couple other facilities that we have throughout the world that we don't tap into. Um, and then we are... Uh, uh, currently looking at um, some funding that was made available to us um, just here recently to bring a compressor uh, facility into Tennessee. So hopefully we see that develop over the next several years. That would be great. That's good news. Very. Very good. Well, I appreciate it. We've ran long. Um, this was a lot of information. I can't thank you enough, Garrett, for being part of this. I appreciate you presenting for us today. Uh, for those that are looking for CEUs, just remember within 72 hours, you'll have a course completion certificate or survey that's sent to you. Just finish that, complete it, send it in, you'll get your certificate. And here's Garrett's information if you want to screenshot that real quick uh, and reach out to him if you have any questions. 
But I can't thank you again enough. And I appreciate you being here. And thanks for your time. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it.